Australia has a long history um, of sort of world first innovations that have had positive influence on the world. So one of the like, classic examples of this is the first you know, industrial fridge. Also uh, some of the more famous ones, the black box, uh, the, F, the uh, airlines improved airline safety across the world. Uh, in more recent times, the first iteration of Google Maps was you know, developed in Australia and now is on most people's phones here today. We also have sort of one of my favorite innovations that come out of Australia, which is the Hills Hoist, otherwise known as the rotating clothesline. Uh, it's brought me a lot of joy in my youth and hopefully, I'm not sure if it's spread to the rest of the world, hopefully it has. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about another sort of Australian world first, which is less positive than those previous examples and certainly less fun uh, than the Hills Hoist. And that's the uh, first time emergence of insecticide resistance of this worldwide pest. It sort of happened and popped up here in Australia. Uh, so, cool. so, hi, yeah, I think we're introduced, but my name's Evan Chergwin. I'm a research scientist at CSER Australia, and today I'm going to be talking about the emergence of insecticide resistance in the blue-green aphid. So a bit of background about blue-green aphid for those who may or may not know what this critter is. So it's pointing? Yeah, cool. So it's a worldwide pest of a number of legume crops, most notably um, lucerne, a um, number of pulses, particularly lentils and lupins. Um, and as with most aphids, it causes a bit of damage via direct feeding, but a lot of the concern we have around aphids, of course, is the transmission of a number of viruses. And again, as with most aphids, they tend to be most problematic and outbreaks happen in spring, but they can also, in a given year, if conditions are right or wrong, uh, be problematic in autumn and winter. Now, a little bit of history about blue-green aphid. Traditionally, it wasn't sort of high-profile or damaging or pests that growers worried about. And in part of this is because we've long had these two older chemistries, organophosphates, so yeah, um, dimethoate, omethoate, copyrifos, and also carbamates that have been um, fairly successful in controlling this pest and also relatively cheaper and easily accessible. And for a long time, these uh, two chemicals have done the trick and also been the only chemicals registered for this pest, at least in most crops. Um, however, a few years ago, about four years ago, five years ago now, um, some growers started reporting that they sort of sprayed this um, very blue-green aphid as they've done in previous years, except this time around it had poor control. And after hearing this multiple accounts, we went and investigated a few of these populations, so just three, so two in um, South Australia, near Keith, um, and one in South, um, New South Wales, near Tamora. We found that these three populations had evolved insecticide resistance to not only these chemicals registered against it, this, but also a third group, synthetic pyrethroids, um, so yeah, alpha cybermethyl and gamma cyphalothon. Um, they aren't registered for this pest, but they still <laughs> evolved resistance against it anyway, which was an interesting finding. And this was also um, the first time anywhere in the world this pest had shown evolution to insecticide resistance. So, although, as we've chatted about today, evolving resistant, resistance to pesticides isn't, um, it's obviously happened before, but because this was the first time happening this species, there was a lot of just unknowns and a lot of questions to be answered after this initial discovery. So, for instance, what regions, which we know it was present in three sites, but where else? We weren't sure if this was sort of one individual new uh, clone that evolved and was just spreading, or if there was multiple um, genetic diversity that might allow a resistance magnitude to evolve over time. Um, again, as for a long time, we only really had these two chemicals to use against this pest, so we didn't really have necessarily a lot of alternative strategies to pivot to after resistance evolved. And the other question, which we'll sort of touch on more towards the end, is we're trying to get at why is resistance evolved here in Australia and not anywhere else, and what can we kind of do to hopefully prevent this happening again to this species or others? Um, and that's sort of started this new project um, through funding the GRDC and AgriFutures Australia and it's a partnership with Lucent Australia to sort of tackle some of these questions. And sort of the first sort of question when we we'll spend most of today is just trying to get at where is this 
uh, new resistant strain will spread to. So we've been sort of busy collecting aphids from across, uh, across southern Australia. Um, so far, I've collected aphids from what was it, 42 sites, which is all those, the ones in purple, the ones we've tested, and I'll show you the results in a second. But we've been looking at multiple different crop types, and we're primarily targeted areas in this sort of southern, southeastern uh, part of Australia because after contacting a bunch of growers and agronomists, this tends to be where I've been hearing cases of this new resistance or control phase popping up or kind of on the edges where control phase have been popping up. Um, so I'll just provide a little bit of background on like how we test this. It's really high level. It's mainly just where when I throw you figures and data later, you can get an idea of what these things mean and what the magnitudes mean relative to how you deal with this pest in the field. So really high level, we grab these aphids from the field, we try and remove all the fungal pathogen and parasitoids they come in with, we breed up a few thousand of them. Um, we then expose them to a range of insecticides, doses. Um, we then over the next few days measure which ones die and what doses they die. And then the, the important bit, I know it's like dull, but it's probably what I want you to focus the most on, is the data analysis. So we compare resistance to all of our insecticides um, so all our field populations to a susceptible population. This is just one that we maintain in the lab. And every time I talk about magnitude, it's all relative to this susceptible population. And we did this so far for three chemicals. So the first one is organophosphate. So, you, so I'm just showing data here for clopyrifos, but we know this approximately holds up for other types of organophosphate, so dimethoate and amethoate. Uh, sort of run through the figure, we have just our, um, diff well, our susceptible population first just in this black line and then each of these three are just different field populations. And I'm just going to start with these three because if I show you, put all 26 it just gets a bit messy um, but I will show you the rest in a second. Uh, and on this horizontal axis you just have the different doses ranging from basically the uh, within the field rate to much below and then just the mortality of these different doses. The thing that jumps out pretty straight away, we had this one population in light blue, um, Jung, which sort of follows this susceptible population pretty closely. It's not much of a shift. These two populations, um, one from Ninnies and one from Pompiel, so right near the, um, uh, the York Peninsula, another one from sort of Central Vic, that show this shift to the right. So requiring much higher dose to get the equivalent levels of mortality. We can sort of highlight this at some discriminatory doses. So for instance, here at this dose, we get virtually 100% of the susceptible population dying, but about 10% of these resistant populations. Now when we quantify the overall sort of resistance magnitude, so basically the shift of the whole curve, this comes to about like a 15 to 30 fold shift in resistance. So this isn't a complete loss of sensitivity, but it is enough at the present field rates to cause uh, some control failures. Um, our next group, uh, so looking at carb mates, so pyrimacarb, and this figure is basically presented the same way. It's just um, using pyrimacarb instead of clopyrifos. And again, we see this same pattern. So these same populations, um, again in purple and orange here, that showed resistance to organophosphates, are again showing resistance to um, uh, carbonates. And we'll look at, we can sort of highlight again, this discriminating dose is a little bit less, but still significant and still present. And when we look at this magnitude, it is slightly less, um, about 5 to 15 fold. Um, and the last chemical, again, synthetic pyrethroids, again, a similar pattern, not a pattern we enjoy seeing, but the pattern still sticks there. When we're finding resistance to one of these chemical groups were tending to find resistance to all three. So there is cross resistance. I need to go through that. So when we sort of map this out, I'll just throw this up across all 26. Um, when, so just very simple, red means where we found resistance, blue is susceptible, the yellow for a few populations um, is a sensitivity shift. Um, so this is populations where we're pretty sure it's resistant, but there's a bit of noise, so we can't be entirely sure, but we're fairly confident. And this is all available on the CSIS uh, website, um, if you want to have a look at it later. Um, 
So a few things sort of jump out. Um, so when we look at the magnitude of resistance, it seems to so far be consistent over time, which suggests to us and that it's most likely a single strain has been spreading around. And indeed, so that initial early um, DNA analysis suggests this is most likely the case. That's one strain, probably just spreading. We found resistance so far has been most common in South Australia. Now, in part, some of this data is because we've got most of our sites from South Australia. Um, but even so, when we look at sort of, I think we've tested about six populations of Victoria, and one that's been resistant. Um, and certainly, the number of control phase, at least we're hearing, and it's very anecdotally, but most of the control phase we're hearing are coming from South Australia. Similarly, where most control phase we're hearing from, they're from Lucen. Um, that's where we're seeing, but we're also seeing it spread up into other crops, particularly lentils and subclover. Um, and a slight sort of thing, I guess going back to those figures before, we are tending to see resistance to be a slightly higher magnitude for organophosphates than uh, carbamates. But we're certainly seeing enough resistance or hit to result in control failures. Um, But I guess going back to what does a lot of this mean for management recommendations, how we use this, go forward. So we've come up with a few uh, things, but it's still very much a start. I mean, the most obvious area is where practical, we're avoiding using these chemicals, um, organophosphates and carbamates. But of course, one of our main goals as MAP is to put our information out there so folks can make the most educated choices about what's more appropriate given their crop in their region, so try to be guided by these maps. And again, they're all available online through CSER. Uh, there are new chemical registered options that have become available. Uh, Sulfoxifor uh, trans so transform has become registered in uh, blue-green aphid in Lucin, and there's a very sort of small number of pulses. It's also available. Um, Spire tetramat to memento, an emergency permit has been approved for lentils in South Australia. Um, and an important point to make is we're always cautious of when these newer chemistries come on the market. They're obviously much more expensive than these traditional older chemistries. And they do come with the uh, temptation to potentially use cut rates. But we do know from past experience with other pests, using these cut rates is, most, is going to usually increase the likelihood of resistance popping up. So it might save you some sort of bang, for, might save you some. Uh, some money in the short term, but in the long run might give you a lot more headaches and a lot more challenges. But outside of um, chemicals, so we're not saying not to use chemicals necessarily, but the least chemicals we do use to reduce the amount of selection pressure going on them. So having more diversity of, of pest control in your arsenal and your toolkit can ultimately reduce the likelihood of selection on insecticide resistance. So we do know a number of these um, predators that naturally occur. And we've been doing a bit of research as part of our current project, doing some surveys on what generalist natural predators occur with, alongside blue-green aphid. So we know things like hoverflies, lacewings, ladybirds, also very um, effective predators. Our research is also showing that on focusing on parasitoids, these are um, wasps. So these are wasps that essentially fly into paddocks, lay their eggs in the aphids. Those eggs then just hatch out, create more wasps, and attack the aphids. And these sort of wasps usually come a couple of weeks behind aphid abundances. And we found really high densities of these, particularly the species, in a few paddocks we've looked at. So we found most of the aphids were collected. They looked really great. And we brought them back to the lab, and in the week, they all sort of died. Well, 95% of them died from this parasitoid. So not initially <laughs> evident that they're doing the job, but they are doing, in some instances, being extremely effective predators of this pest. Um, so one of the best and sort of simplest management methods to protect these or help protect them is uh, using our, well, the chemical um, toxicity guide that Steve has developed for the grains industry. You can talk to Rosie. She's got a great poster. If you have any questions about it, I'm sure she'll be more than happy. Um, and it's also available online uh, if you want to reference this. 
so this might seem a really obvious one, but I think it's important, like aphid monitoring. So of course you want to try and pick which aphids in your crop. That it seems really, really obvious, but um, I think it's really important for blue-green aphid because there's two species that look nearly exactly the same. They're nearly tax the all the exact same crop types, but their resistances differ. So taking a bit of a minute to have a look what aphids there um, can give you a bit of an indication of what's the most appropriate course of action. So here's a blue-green aphid. Here's a pea aphid. They attack nearly, uh, nearly all the same type of crops, while pea aphid actually attack a few more different types. Um, it's a lot of, uh, been multiple cases where we've been out searching for species, we've chatted to a grower or agronomist, we've pointed towards a paddock that says there's lots of blue-green aphid there, it's all been pea aphid. And same with samples being sent in. So this is a really common misconception. And again, the main thing, I guess we have insecticide resistance here. In Australia, anyway, there's no insecticide resistance yet in this species. Um, so being able to ID them, we have a bunch of information online. I'm not going to bore you with the different subtle differences here, but being across these differences can help you choose what chemicals are most effective. And of course, there's a few cultural uh, control options. We do know there are some varieties that have um, more resistant to aphid feeding damage that are out there. Of course, what we've chatted on today, using these different varieties has challenges. Um, um, but other cultural issues, methods, we know alternative hosts. So for instance, a lot of medics, um, weeds, a lot of um, sort of volunteer vetch and lucerne can pop up around the edges of paddocks. And this can provide aphids alternative hosts through summer. So at least by keeping an eye on these type of alternative hosts around the paddock edges can at least potentially delay these aphids coming into your paddock um, during um, growing season. So to end, well, close to the end, I just want to sort of return to this uh, slide in part because I spent a lot of time putting it together, a lot of graphical, uh, my heart into this. I'm not very good at art, so it's put, it took me a lot of time. Um, but I think it's worth reflecting. So talking a lot about resistance today, and it can kind of get desensitized by Resistance just sort of happens when you spray, but I think it's worth reflecting that this is a worldwide pest. You know, it's a huge problem in the USA. It's a big problem in multiple parts of Asia and Europe and South America, but here it's where resistance is developed for the first time. It hasn't popped up there, um, but why is it developed here? Um, are we unlucky, or are there things that we need to reflect on that we could be doing better? not just for blue-green aphid control, but also other pests. Are there other pests, for instance, we touched on the pea aphid there earlier, doesn't have resistance. We don't want to push it to having resistance. And why we suspect, we, don't, we can never guarantee, but why we suspect resistance has evolved here is because, again, reliance on these two groups of insecticides, a very similar mode of action, so we're pre producing constant selection on these. So implementing these ideas of rotation, I know it's a challenge, uh, is an important course going forward. And of course, we're going to need for these recommendations put up here don't solve all the problems. We are going to need further innovations to kind of tackle this issue. But you know, as we like to show by the Hills Hoist, we are capable of some great innovations. And we do need to put on some of these innovations to try and deal with this problem. Um, I will end on just saying we're still collecting samples um, for our resistance screening. So if you saw our maps before and you thought I, where I live is a gap and I'm worried about blue-green aphid resistance, um, come chat to us about sending samples in. If you can, aphids are great, you can chuck them in the post and then we can then set up lab colonies. Um, and then we can hopefully fill in those gaps for where, uh, where, you, where you currently work or live. Um, and oh yeah. So sort of thanks, this work's all been funded through AgriFutures and GRDC. It's been run in collaboration with in Australia. There's been a huge number of agros and farmers and growers that have just been, <laughs> spent a lot of their time either helping us collect samples or just conversations to help us get understand what the problem is. And there's been many collaborators on this project along the way. And I'll ask some questions, I'll just throw these up. Just resources, if anyone has any questions, you can also look at that. Thanks. Thanks, Herbert. Any questions for Ebert?
Uh, Jason? Um, yeah. Uh, we've tested. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the question was just asking if we've tested other modes of action. Uh, we have tested um, one other, not neonix. Um, so the other modes of action we've been looking at are modes of action that are used elsewhere in the world for this pest. So um, fly flu propin, which is group 4D, uh, I can't remember. Um, but we did find for those modes of action, um, that particular mode of action, there was no resistance. And for these other groups, so that's all Foxel 4 um, uh, as well. For, we have not tested it, but at least from what we're hearing back in the field, it's been quite effective. But we, we're keen to do some more work to get those baseline information. So if resistance does pop up later down the line, we have that data to hand. From the online audience, uh, what conditions are conducive for an outbreak? Uh, I mean, we think the main, the main thing is effectively sort of climate, I think. Uh, so the last few years probably hasn't released, I think it was about 2020, 2019, when we had sort of perfect conditions. So aphids are most sort of happy when the conditions are, I guess, around sort of 16 to 23 degrees. So if we're getting those large chunks through spring of those conditions, they just have happy reproducing large numbers if it starts to get much hotter they'll start to die off a bit if it gets colder they're not going to reproduce fast enough so it's really so those temperature based conditions are probably the will lead to the biggest outbreaks but yeah within season anyway yeah Ron. Oh. yeah yeah Mm. But it's also a big issue in the horticulture industry. And uh, I was wondering whether you've got any comment about uh, other industries where you might get crossover or um, issues, you know, transparent. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the biggest one, so it's not super big in hort. Uh, it's not big, but it's the. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, the question was uh, what other industries, blue grain aphids, an issue in our. Um, how we, I guess, collaborating with them. Ah, uh, yeah, with hort, so we find, yeah, it's, it's predominantly sort of legume crops. Um, we don't, as far as like fruits and vegetables, we, they do pop up there, but very rarely to any abundances where they're an issue. Um, there's other species, sort of related species, like uh, PA for the bit more wider hosts that can be more problematic, but the main one we're working a lot with the pasture and pasture seeds industries between um, the grains because uh, at the moment there's currently different registrations for the different industries so we're trying to sort of avoid a bit of confusion about what chemicals are used when but that's something we're definitely in, in uh, discussion with both industries to try to come up with a, a, a together a plan that means one industry is not going to be managing it poorly and then spread those resistance are going to spread into the other industry and vice versa, um, which is, yeah. Okay, we might need to uh, yeah. wrap it up there. Thanks, Evan. Thanks. Uh,